Hi, I am Ajit Virkud, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Mumbai. Hello citizens of the internet. In this part 2 of my series on preeclampsia and gestational hypertension, I am going to discuss in detail the pathophysiology of this dreadful disease. This is the most important part of the series because a lot of new knowledge has come to light in this regard. Preeclampsia is a multi-system disorder. Its pathophysiology is still poorly understood. The first decade of this millennium has witnessed major advances in our understanding about the pathophysiology of preeclampsia. Recent observations support the hypothesis that altered expression of placental anti-angiogenic factors are responsible for the clinical manifestations of the disease. Preeclampsia is considered as a two-stage disease which is now better understood. In normal pregnancy, cytotrophoblasts change their phenotype into endothelial cells and line the spiral arterioles by destroying their intimal and muscular coat, making them low resistance vessels, thus increasing blood flow across their lumen. In preeclampsia, however, the invasion of the spiral arteries by cytotrophoblast is incomplete. That is, the second wave of trophoblastic penetration does not occur. In other words, there is insufficient remodeling of spiral arteries. Thus, spiral arteries remain constricted and blood flow through the placenta is restricted. This ultimately leads to placental ischemia. This is the beginning of preeclampsia. Why does this happen? We really don't know. This is one of the holy grails of obstetrics. In the past, we used to call it toxemia of pregnancy. So which is the toxin coming from the placenta that enters the maternal circulation and causes the dreadful maternal disease? In the last 10 years, we have acquired some new insights into the pathophysiology. The answer is almost there. It is anti-angiogenic factors. In normal pregnancy, soluble angiogenic factors like vascular endothelial growth factor VEGF, placental growth factors PLGF and transforming growth factors beta, PGF beta help the blood vessels to grow and keep the endothelial healthy. In preeclampsia, however, the placenta releases two factors which are receptors for the angiogenic factors they get sliced off and enter the maternal circulation. These are soluble FMS like tyrosine kinase 1 and soluble endoglin. They are called anti-angiogenic factors. They bind and block the angiogenic growth factors. In a nutshell, this is what causes preeclampsia. I will discuss this in more detail. Production of placental anti-angiogenic factors specifically soluble FMS related tyrosine kinase 1 and soluble endoglin have been shown to be upregulated in preeclampsia. These placental anti-angiogenic factors are released into the maternal circulation. Their actions disrupt the maternal endothelium and result in hypertension, proteinuria and the other systemic manifestations of preeclampsia. The molecular basis of placental dysregulation of these pathogenic factors remains unknown. Hypoxia is likely an important regulator. Other factors such as alterations in the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone axis, immune maladaptation, excessive shedding of trophoblast debris, oxidative stress and genetic factors are likely to contribute to the pathogenesis of the abnormal placentation. As of 2011, the role of angiogenic proteins in early placental vascular development is starting to be explored. The data linking angiogenic factors to preeclampsia have exciting clinical manifestations and likely will transform the detection and treatment of preeclampsia. Is this evidence-based? Yes. There is a fairly good evidence for this. Experiments have shown 
that S split 1 and S endocrine can produce a preeclampsia like syndrome in rodents and that vascular endothelial growth factor rescues rodents from the syndrome in human beings maternal blood S split 1 and placental growth factor ratio predicts onset of preeclampsia about 5 weeks earlier this also has treatment possibilities vascular endothelial growth factor and statins are now being experimentally used in treatment of preeclampsia i have said earlier that preeclampsia is now considered as a two stage disease so what is this two stage theory proponents of this theory hypothesize that preeclampsia is a systemic syndrome that originates in the placenta and is characterized by maternal widespread endothelial dysfunction preeclampsia has two separate types based on when the disease manifests early onset preeclampsia also known as preterm preeclampsia which occurs prior to 34 weeks and late onset preeclampsia also known as term preeclampsia which manifests after 37 weeks gestational age between 34 to 37 weeks is considered the gray zone i do not mean to say that preeclampsia cannot occur between 34 to 37 weeks but we do not know what to do with that now let us see how they are different diseases characteristic features of early onset preeclampsia are it is always severe type it has up to 8 times more cardiovascular morbidity than women with normal pregnancy recurrence of preeclampsia in subsequent pregnancies is as high as 60% anti angiogenic factors are better predictors for early onset preeclampsia and iugr is more likely with early onset preeclampsia late onset preeclampsia on the other hand may be mild or severe it has 1.7 times higher cardiovascular morbidity than women with normal pregnancy recurrence of preeclampsia in subsequent pregnancies is only 10 to 20% and it is not associated with iugr actually babies with late onset preeclampsia have higher birth weights before i proceed i will ask you a question why is preeclampsia a disease of the second half of pregnancy gestational hypertension or preeclampsia is a disease of the second half of pregnancy because the second wave of trophoblastic invasion that is essential for prevention of preeclampsia occurs only between 16 to 20 weeks the basic pathology in gestational hypertension or preeclampsia is vasoconstriction of arterioles which occurs throughout the maternal body the vascular changes and local hypoxia of the surrounding tissues leads to hemorrhage necrosis and other pathological changes in the various organ systems preeclampsia creates a functional derangement of multiple organ systems such as central nervous system hematological system hepatic renal and cardiovascular systems i will discuss the damage occurring in each system and its clinical implications one by one first the central nervous system there is a diffuse arterial vasoconstriction leading to cerebral ischemia infarction and edema when the mean arterial pressure exceeds 120 mm of mercury cerebral autoregulation fails failure of cerebral autoregulation results in petechial hemorrhages and rarely frank intracranial hemorrhage especially in the presence of hypertensive crisis this leads to symptoms like headaches which are occipital mental confusion drowsiness dizziness and convulsions pontine hemorrhages associated with pinpoint pupils and hyperparesia may be seen rarely hemorrhage in the vision center can lead to cortical blindness hepatic damage resulting from ischemia secondary to vasospasm coupled with fibrin deposition secondary to endothelial damage leads to subcapsular hemorrhage peripheral necrosis infarctions and rarely hepatic rupture liver damage is associated with clinical symptoms of 
nausea, vomiting, epigastric pain, and right hypochondriac tenderness. It also leads to mildly elevated liver enzyme levels. Microhemorrhage and necrosis may occur in endocrine glands like pituitary, pancreas, and adrenal glands also. As far as the cardiovascular system is concerned, the cardiac output and peripheral vascular resistance are raised. Patients with preeclampsia have hypovolemia and therefore have less tolerance for blood loss associated with delivery. This leads to clinical features of weight gain, edema, raised hemoglobin and raised serum creatinine levels. Remember, the vascular hallmark of preeclampsia is hemoconcentration. Patients with only gestational hypertension do not have hemoconcentration. Rarely, myocardial and subendocardial hemorrhage and necrosis may occur. Cardiac damage may ultimately lead to left ventricular failure. Increased capillary permeability in the lungs leads to congestion and this coupled with hemorrhage may lead to secondary bronchopneumonia. Patients will complain of breathlessness and chest discomfort. The severe complication is pulmonary edema. The pathognomic renal lesion in preeclampsia is called glomerular capillary endotheliosis, which is swelling of the glomerular capillary endothelial and mesangial cells. This leads to decreased glomerular filtration rate by about 50%, loss of protein in urine, that is albuminuria, and elevated serum levels of uric acid, urea, and creatinine. Serum uric acid levels is diagnostic and prognostic for severe preeclampsia. The hallmark placental lesion in preeclampsia is acute atherosis of the decidual arterioles, that is, endothelial damage by mononuclear cell infiltration, deposition of lipids and lipophages in arterial walls. The end result is placental hypoperfusion. Infarcts may also be seen in the placenta. This ultimately results in decreased utero-placental blood flow, that is, chronic placental insufficiency, leading to oligohyramnios, intrauterine growth restriction, fetal distress, and ultimately fetal demise. Placental thrombosis and infarction can also lead to abruptio placentae. Changes seen in the retina are arteriolar spasm, hemorrhage, exudation, and rarely in severe cases, exudative retinal detachment. These are responsible for the characteristic changes seen in the retina on fundoscopy and for reversible blindness. As far as the coagulation system is concerned, there is thrombocytopenia, fibrin production is increased, fibrinolytic activity is decreased, factor 7, factor 8 related antigen and fibrin degradation product concentrations in the plasma are all increased. Fibrin and platelet deposition is increased, particularly in the placental arteries. Platelets are activated in the microcirculation of the placenta, kidney and liver. The end result of these changes is hypercoagulability and disseminated intravascular coagulation in severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. Before I finish, there is one more thing, as Steve Jobs would say. I want to talk about the increased capillary permeability that occurs in preeclampsia as a result of endothelial dysfunction. This causes leaking of proteins like fibronectin into the extravascular space. Loss of protein leads to decreased plasma oncotic pressure. This in turn causes fluid that is water shift from the intravascular to the extravascular compartment. This is the reason why there is tissue and clinical edema in preeclampsia. This is also why it is said that preeclampsia is associated with hemoconcentration, that is, a decreased intravascular volume. Please note that every case of preeclampsia does not have reduced intravascular volume, and investigations such as 
H by H ratio and cerium creatinine are required for the same. I will talk about it in the third part. After such a long e lecture, it is time to summarize the pathogenesis of preeclampsia. Immune factors such as 81 AA, oxidative stress, natural killer cell abnormalities and other factors may cause placental dysfunction which in turn leads to release of soluble anti-angiogenic factors such as S-flit1 and S-endoglin and other inflammatory mediators into the maternal circulation that induces global endothelial dysfunction. This in turn leads to hypertension, ischemia and necrosis of various maternal organs such as kidneys, liver, lungs, central nervous system, coagulation system and other complications of preeclampsia. This is the end of part 2 of my series of e-lectures on preeclampsia. In part 3, I will talk about the diagnosis and management of preeclampsia. For further reading on this topic and other topics in obstetrics and gynecology, refer to following books written by me. Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology Modern Obstetrics Modern Gynecology Clinical Cases in Obstetrics Questions and Answers Clinical Cases in Gynecology Questions and Answers and Pelvic Reconstructive Surgery If you have found this video useful and informative, please subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking here.